Hi everybody and welcome back to another episode of There I Read It where we are now on chapter 14, no sorry 15 of Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets called Aragog and this is by far the creepiest chapter of Harry Potter that I have ever read. Of course, keeping in mind the whole point of this series is that I never have read Harry Potter before, so at least as of the first 15 chapters of Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets and the last book, Sorcerer's Stone, this is definitely the creepiest thing I've read. But I'm not a big spider fan anyways. Ugh. And yeah, that's basically the whole recap of this chapter is spiders. Ugh. But to go over my mini notes here, now that we have all of these different students who have been petrified, Madame Pomfrey has now barred visitors from entering the hospital so that an attacker doesn't sneak in to finish the kids off. And I just keep thinking, I'm sure by the end of this book everybody's going to be healed and fine, but they describe these kids as being petrified with their eyes open. So can you just imagine the amount of scratchy red dry eye? How do they keep that from causing permanent damage? I know the answer's got to be magic, but I, I still feel like there's got to be some kind of residual effect after going through petrification for months. And at the end of the last chapter, Harry was told by Hagrid before he was escorted out of Hogwarts to follow the spiders to get your answers. Problem is, Harry can't find any spiders anywhere. And it turns out I was actually mistaken. I thought that Dumbledore was being completely removed from his headmaster position, but he is only being suspended, he hasn't actually been fired at this stage, and McGarnagle is the temporary headmaster while they look for a replacement or wait for Dumbledore to come back. Whichever happens first, I guess. And Draco's just sort of super proud of his father Lucius for being able to get rid of Dumbledore, and you can see that Draco really just kind of parrots whatever his father says to him because he wants his father's approval so badly. But Malfoy's talking about how, well, Dumbledore's the worst headmaster Hogwarts has ever seen, and Snape chimes in with a snide little comment and Malfoy's like, oh, you know what? I'm going to tell my dad that you should be headmaster, that you're the best teacher at this school. And honestly, I cannot imagine Snape trying to run Hogwarts. I feel like the students would hate it and Harry would be expelled in a millisecond. Like he would not last a week, especially not with all the shenanigans he gets into. I mean, in the first book, you could say a lot of the things that happened were out of Harry's control, but now he knows better. Now he's better acclimated to the wizard world and he's still up to double and triple the shenanigans. So Harry seems to have this whole attitude of like he's untouchable, he can't get caught, he'll never really get in trouble. So I'm sure the idea of Snape taking over Hogwarts is absolutely horrifying even though for whatever reason the book doesn't weigh in on Harry's opinion of that at all. Which is funny because every time they get a chance the book seems to go oh Harry's feeling so bad about himself, oh Harry's sitting here ruminating about how how awful you know his life is and it, it's just like okay Harry come on you're in a wizard school get up get with it take a breath quit lamenting that your life sucks and you know do the spells and while Malfoy is running his mouth he says something about how Hermione should have died he wishes Hermione was killed and at that Ron actually gets so angry that he shoots up off of his seat and I, I thought that was curious because Ron seems to be very, very, very protective of Hermione in this book when he didn't seem to care for her much in the first book. And I'm not sure why that is, but I'm starting to see a glimmer that Ron kind of has a crush on Hermione. And it's not the same kind of crush that like Jenny has on Harry because she's very quiet and you know, let me just stand behind you and stare at you Harry because I love you. Like the over possessive girlfriend meme. But Ron is more like the type of, hey, I'm gonna kind of pick on you because I like you, but may the ministry help whoever else tries to pick on Hermione because she's mine to abuse. I don't know, I wouldn't quite say that Ron is negging Hermione, which is where a guy says really negative stuff to a girl, gets in her head, and then he can kind of swoop in and use her however he wants. But it definitely seems like Ron's treatment of Hermione, especially in the first book, kind of borders on negging. But now it's time for Herbology, and the kids have to prune Abyssinian shrivel figs. And I know how to say that one correctly because I was very heavily involved in the cat world for a while, so I know Abyssinian, I know what that looks like. Some of these other words I'm like, Abrajipa? 
I don't know how to form letters. And while in Herbology, Ernie McMillan, which was the Hufflepuff who was accusing Harry of being the bad guy earlier, he actually apologizes for suspecting Harry at all and says, you know, I know you'd never hurt Hermione, so it can't be you. And then Ernie is kind of like, I think it might be Draco Malfoy who's the heir of Slytherin. And Harry's just like, no. And he doesn't explain it. So everybody is kind of getting a vibe that something's up or Harry knows what what's up, but he's not sharing. And lucky enough, Harry notices two spiders in the greenhouse and they're making a beeline out of the greenhouse towards what seems to be the Forbidden Forest. And I had totally forgotten this, but apparently Ron was not in the Forbidden Forest in the last book. It was Hermione, Neville, and Malfoy, I believe, that got to go. Or I guess had to go. It wasn't really got to go like you wanted to go to the beach or something. It was a punishment. And a really weird one considering how easy it would be for kids to get murdered in there. But a whole different story. Or maybe it's not a whole different story because now it's making me wonder if a girl dying at Hogwarts is what almost caused Hogwarts to be shut down 50 years ago, why would they be risking a student's life or multiple students' lives to send them to the Forbidden Forest in the first book. See, Dumbledore, he's up to a lot more than he ever says, which is pretty obvious, I know, but there's so many little things that you don't even necessarily consider that Dumbledore is manipulating when he has to be. You know, Harry needed to go into the Forbidden Forest in the first book so that he could start putting together information about Voldemort and who he is and what he's doing. And now, of course, that experience is coming in handy for the second book, but Ron did not go to the Forbidden Forest in the first book because Norbert the dragon had bit him and he was out of commission for that period of time. So Ron didn't actually help get Norbert out of Hogwarts, which means Ron didn't get caught out of his room after hours and get detention and then get sent to the Forbidden Forest as punishment. So this is all a new nightmare for him. But even though Harry sees the spiders and he gets an idea of where they're going, he can't follow them because it would be too conspicuous. All the kids have to stay grouped together, the teachers are walking them from one class to the next, so he can't exactly leave in the middle of the day to go chase spiders into the woods. Into the woods! But next class is Defense Against the Dark Arts, and Lockhart is just overjoyed and elated and telling the kids there's nothing to worry about anymore, all the threat is over with, it's all good, it's all fine now. And Lockhart feels this way because he thinks the Minister of Magic would have never taken Hagrid away unless Hagrid was 100% proven to be guilty. And it's sort of interesting how the politics of the wizarding world are starting to surface here, because just in general, I find politics to be a very fascinating subject. So to see where this really pompous, arrogant kind of wizard is just so blindly devoted to his government and believing everything that they tell him, it, it's sort of a hint at what the future of these books can and do and bring out on the political side of the wizarding world and I, I'm kind of really excited to see how that goes. But now it's nighttime and Harry and Ron get back into that invisibility cloak and sneak into the Forbidden Forest with Fang and they have to get off the path which Harry is a little bit wary to do because Hagrid always told him stay on the path in the forest or you'll be in serious danger. But the little spiders they found to follow are not staying on the path so they don't really have a choice and this huge thing starts kind of creaking towards them and it turns out to be the missing flying car. I flat out chuckle snorted when I saw that. That, that just made my day. And I don't know what happened to this car in the Forbidden Forest, but it seems a lot more sentient than it was before. Like the entire time that Ron and Harry flew the car to Hogwarts, the car was just a car that could fly. The car really didn't have any personality or control or anything like that over itself until it ran away from the Whomping Willow and ejected the boys out. But now the car is a lot more like a giant dog that you can climb inside. It's like a cat bus. And instead of getting inside of the car and being smart and safe like they should have done, the boys are too busy staring at the car and they end up getting captured by these gigantic spiders that are described as being the size of a cart horse. I'm not exactly sure what that is. I think that's like an old horse and buggy kind of thing where it's either the big carriage or the carriage and the horse combined. I have not heard the term cart horse before. Oh, it's a draft horse, so it's like a Clydesdale. I mean, that's, that's big, don't get 
me wrong, but I, I was thinking quite a bit bigger if the spiders were carrying the kids in their arms. Ugh. But the spiders take the boys and Fang into the heart of the Forbidden Forest and they go up to this domed web, which I assume is kind of house-like, and they start screaming out, Aragog! And then this blind spider, who is described as the size of a small elephant, which is a weird unit of measurement because, I mean, there's different kinds of elephants, and do they mean small like a baby elephant or just like shorter than normal? I would have preferred a much better unit of measurement than small elephant, but um, assumably that's going to be a spider that's probably worth four or five Clydesdales. And Aragog comes out and he's like, is it Hagrid? No. Okay, well then kill them which is curious because of what Aragog says in a second here. So when Harry says, no, no, wait, we're friends of Hagrid, please don't kill us, Aragog ends up explaining that he is not the Chamber of Secrets monster. He's actually from a distant land and somebody gave him to Hagrid when he was just an egg. My bet is he came from Brazil like all the other horrible spiders. But Aragog is very fond of Hagrid because Hagrid raised him in a cupboard under the stairs, kind of like Harry. Although Harry is not fond of the people who took care of him while he was growing up. But Aragog has mad love for Hagrid. He says Hagrid protected him when Hogwarts wanted to kill him, and that Hagrid kept visiting Aragog over the years and even brought him a wife whose name is Mosag. Mosag? M-O-S-A-G? Mosag? Mosag? Something like that. Mossig. And Aragog says that he has never harmed a human, even though it's against his nature of how a spider would be wanting to eat flesh and ugh. But he never hurt a human out of respect for Hagrid. And Aragog doesn't say it, but it's kind of implied that he kept his children under that same philosophy because obviously the giant spiders are his offspring with his wife. And the entire floor of this place where Aragog lives is filled to the brim with all the little spiders spiders that have come run into homecoming like oh, I can't oh, my skin is crawling just saying it out loud I hate this and Aragog says he knew what the chamber monster was but it's the thing that his kind fears the most so he would not say what its name was not even to Hagrid when he begged which as Harry points out later is kind of like Voldemort where nobody wants to say its name because they're so afraid but even after going through this whole spiel about how Aragog does not eat people out of respect for his beloved Hagrid, Aragog then offers Ron and Harry up for his children to eat because, well, how could I tell them no when you so haphazardly walked into their field of vision, I guess? So this is a really weird double standard where he's describing, no, me and my children don't eat humans because I love my bro Hagrid. Even though Hagrid I don't think is a human, he's a giant, which should technically be something else, right? Or is he only half giant? I don't even think they've gotten into Hagrid's backstory yet, so I don't think I'm supposed to know or guess at that at this point. But whatever some kind of something that Hagrid is, it's definitely not all human. But yeah, Aragog being, oh, we don't eat people because I love Hagrid, but since you're here, nom nom, I mean, yeah, it's weird. It doesn't quite make sense. And just as Harry and Ron and poor little Fanny who wanted nothing to do with any of this but got drug along, are about to be eaten. Honk honk! Here comes Kari to save the day! And this time they don't dawdle in jumping into the car as the car takes them to the edge of the Forbidden Forest and then lets them out because apparently Kari loves the Forbidden Forest now. Like, this is his world. He is not going back to men. He is a free Ford now! And so Fang ends up running back home, which I want to add, they say that Fang ran away with his tail between his legs to Hagrid's hut, but they do not describe letting Fang back in the hut. So I hope there was an open window or a doggy door or something for that poor guy because I would not want to be outside alone in this situation, and I'm sure that poor cowardly dog does not either. But now Fang's gone, the boys are back in their dorm room, Ron is fast asleep, and Harry's just sitting there kind of mauling everything over, and it occurs to him that the last person who died in Hogwarts was a girl who died in a bathroom. And he's like, oh my gosh, I bet it's Moaning Myrtle, the new character that was introduced in this book that has served no other rational purpose up until now. Huzzah! 
Overall, uh, again, I really hated this chapter. It was neat, it had some neat elements in it, but ugh, <laughs> I just like, I need to go shower after reading ugh, about all these hairy, gross giant spiders. Ugh, can't take it. But I'm kind of on Team Ron here that the boys went on this huge, life-threatening adventure and they really didn't get anything out of it for all that they risked. Sure, now they know that Hagrid is definitely innocent, but they kind of were already leaning that way to begin with so I I don't know I'm confused because Hagrid made it seem like oh if you just follow the spiders you're gonna learn about everything and no you just learned a tiny bit more than you knew before and even the thing that you did learn it wasn't exactly new information you just weren't a hundred percent certain about it yet but we are so close to the end of this book I'm really excited to kind of book it to the end ha 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 pun intended because I feel more confident than ever at this point that the chamber monster has to be some snake Medusa kind of creature. I just want to be proven right. I can figure out mysteries in children's books. Look at me, I'm fancy. Anyways guys, thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, come back next week, hang out some more, comment all you can. I love having these discussions with everybody. Of course, by the time this airs, I'm probably gonna be decently into book three, but I still ask that you don't comment any spoilers just for the sake of people who are reading along as I publish the videos. And uh, I will see you next time. Hopefully there are no more spiders in this book because I might flip out even if they describe little tiny ones at this point. Oh, just all that clicking noise that they made while they talk. Ugh, I can just, I can, ugh, I hear it. I feel it. This is how Frollo felt when he got obsessed with Esmeralda. He just couldn't get her out of his system. Wait, did I just describe being romantically attracted to spiders? Because no, no, that's, that's not a correct analogy at all. Oh, bye guys. I'm just, that's it. Just bye. Well, family members, we're almost done, but I want to invite you to hang out with me in some other places. I'm on Twitter and Instagram as my own personal self, and I have a Facebook page too, but I mostly just post photos over there. And sometimes people say, hey, McGann, I want to mail you something. How do I do that? Easy. Just click the About tab on my channel page, and my most current P.O. Box info will be right there. I also run another channel, The Family. It's really a hodgepodge channel where we might post anything. Oh yeah, and I also sell shirts and stickers and stuff with the family and the fangirl logos. If that is your cup of tea, I have a link in every description of every video. Finally, if you want to help out the fangirl channel and make sure I'm putting out video essays for years to come, the best way you can help is by subscribing and watching more of my videos, whether they're new, old, whatever. Maybe even share one or two on social media, help spread the word. People who watch to the end of videos like you helps to tell the site, hey, this is a good video. We should recommend it to other people. So if you made it this far, leave me a comment of something like, hey, I made it to the end. Love ya. See you next time, family members. Bye.